Hello, my name is Emma Snape, Manager of Public Programs for the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage. On behalf of everyone at the museum, welcome to our virtual program, Documentary Talkback, Ruth, Justice Ginsburg in her own words. This program is inspired by our current special exhibition, Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, presented locally by PNC Bank. Thank you to PNC and to all of our sponsors and partners today, including today's programming partners, the ACLU of Ohio, Classrooms Without Borders, Cleveland International Film Festival, the Fund for Women and Girls, Hillel at Kent State University, Progress Mahoning Valley, and the Jewish Community Relations Council of the Youngstown Area Jewish Federation, all of whom helped make it possible to bring an exhibition like this one to Cleveland and to support it with programs as exciting as today's. The exhibition is open now until August 29th, and we're welcoming visitors to join us safely in person Wednesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. We're currently requiring that all museum visitors wear a mask, regardless of vaccination status, in keeping with current CDC guidance. There will be one final public virtual tour of the exhibition this coming Tuesday, August 17th at 2 p.m. over Zoom. You can book tickets for either now on our website, www.maltzmuseum.org. I'm so glad you've connected with us already and that you're here now for today's program. There will be a time for a Q&A at the end of the program and throughout. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please send them in the chat to all panelists or through the Q&A feature and I'll compile them for Justice Stewart, our moderator for today's panel. Melody Stewart was elected in 2018 as the 161st Justice to serve on the Supreme Court of Ohio. Prior to joining the Supreme Court, Justice Stewart served on the 8th District Court of Appeals for 12 years and was the court's administrative judge in 2013. After starting her legal career as an assistant law director for the cities of Cleveland and East Cleveland, Justice Stewart subsequently worked as a lecturer and adjunct instructor and assistant dean at Cleveland Marshall College of Law before joining the full-time faculty at the law school. Additionally, she taught at the University of Toledo College of Law and at Ursuline College. She was also director of student services at Case Western Reserve University's School of Law. Justice Stewart earned a Bachelor of Music degree from the College Conservatory of Music at the University of Cincinnati, her law degree from Cleveland Marshall, and her PhD as a Mendel Leadership Fellow at Case Western Reserve University's Mendel School of Applied Social Sciences. She was also awarded an Honorary Doctor of Laws degree from Cleveland State University. Justice Stewart has served on many boards and committees, including the Ohio Criminal Justice Recodification Committee, the Ohio Supreme Court's Judicial College Board, was chair of the Ohio Capital Case Attorney Fee Council, and served as a commissioner and chair of the Board of Planning and Zoning of the city of Euclid. Justice Stewart is admitted to practice in the state and federal courts of Ohio, the District of Columbia, and the United States Supreme Court. Of historical note, Justice Stewart is the first African-American woman elected to the Ohio Supreme Court. And now, without any further ado, Justice Stewart, would you take it away and introduce our panelists today? Thank you. Thank you, Emma, for that introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, in case those of you are unaware, my background is that of the United States Supreme Court. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our um, wonderful panelists this afternoon. We're gonna first start with Frida Lee Mock, who is an Academy Award and Emmy Award winning director, writer, and producer of theatrical documentary films. Her five Academy Award nominations include Maya Lin, which is a film, uh, Maya Lin, A Strong Vision, which is a feature film about creativity and the designer of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, DC. Her Oscar nominated films are Rose Kennedy, A Life to Remember, Sing, a film about a world renowned children's choir, Never Give Up, about the conductor and Holocaust survivor, Dr. Herbert Zimmer, and To Live and Let Die a story about medical ethics. The film Ruth, Justice Ginsburg in her own words, which I hope all of you have had the chance to watch, is Frida's newest film released this year. Frida is based in Santa Monica, California. 
Our next panelist is Kathleen Paradis. Kathleen is currently a partner at the law firm of Alton and Golden in New York, where she practices employment law representing employees. And in 1973, when Kathleen was practicing out of Los Angeles, she met then attorney Ruth Bader Ginsburg at a conference of women's rights litigators sponsored by the Ford Foundation. The next year, Ruth hired Kathleen to succeed her as co-director of the ACLU's Women's Rights Project, where the, for, for the next five years, Kathleen collaborated with Ruth Bader Ginsburg in uh, Ruth's Supreme Court litigation and many other gender discrimination cases in courts across the country. Kathleen and Justice Ginsburg remained friends until then, until the justice's passing last year. Oftentimes speaking on her behalf at various programs, including one at the US Supreme Court celebrating Justice Ginsburg's 20 year anniversary in the court. Kathleen was part of the team characterized in the film as the war team assembled by Justice Ginsburg's husband, Marty in 1993 to get Justice Ginsburg nominated to the United States Supreme Court. In addition to her law practice, Kathleen serves as co-chair of the advisory committee for the Middle East North Africa Division of Human Rights Watch, the co-chair of Jewish Currents, and member of the Board of Americans for Peace Now. She is a former chair and former general counsel of the New York Civil Liberties Union, founding chair of the Women's Rights Division of Human Rights Watch, and former columnist of, uh, for the Forward. And last but not least is Lily Ledbetter, the name plaintiff in one of the most notable United States Supreme Court cases of modern day. Lily was born in a small town in the small town of Possum Trot, Alabama, in a house with no running water or electricity. But despite those circumstances, she knew she was destined for something more. In 1979, with two small children and over the initial objections of her husband, Lily applied for what was then her dream job in management at the Goodyear Tire Factory at its plant in Gadsden, Alabama. Even though the only women she'd ever seen working at Goodyear were the secretaries in the front offices where she submitted her application, she applied for a position and got the job becoming one of the first women hired at the management level at Goodyear. While she faced daily gender prejudice and sexual harassment, Lily pressed on, believing that eventually things would change. Until 19 years later, after her first day at Goodyear, Lily received an anonymous note revealing that she was making thousands of dollars less than um, the men in her position. Devastated, she filed a sex discrimination case against Goodyear, which she won at the trial court level, only to have that win taken away on appeal. Over the next eight years, her case made it all the way to the US Supreme Court, where she again lost. The court ruled that she should have filed that suit 180 days after her first unequal paycheck, despite the fact that she had no way of knowing that she was being paid unfairly. In a dramatic moment for her, when Justice Ruth Bader, Bader Ginsburg read her dissenting opinion from the bench, urging Lily to fight back, that is exactly what she did. Lily Ledbetter became the namesake of President Barack Obama's first official, official piece of legislation, the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. Today, she is a tireless advocate for change, traveling the country to urge women and minorities to claim their civil rights. Welcome all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me start off a question to, to uh, Frida. The very entrance of the film, beginning of the film, asks the question, how does someone with three strikes get to the US Supreme Court? And was that the, the format all along for you in bringing the film together from fruition to the end? Yes. Um... You know, we, in order to, to create a film like this, it entails a great deal of what I call primary research, both particularly in books, both secondary and primary sources. And, um, and this, but also visual materials. And I came across, it turns out it's in the film, you hear um, a 
she, in this film, in talking to these fifth graders, said that she had three strikes against me. You know, she was a woman, she was a Jew, a Jew, she was Jewish, and she was a mother. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that that was a kind of a nice way to explore who she is and all the manifestations from childhood to her, her journey to the Supreme Court. How do you make it? How do you get there? Particularly when we were finishing the film, uh, the Kavanaugh hearings mm -hmm. were taking place in 218. Ah. And so I think without saying it, you could see dramatically two different ways to, to rise to the Supreme Court. And uh, I think her, her journey overcoming major obstacle, obstacles was a wonderful way to engage the audience to ask themselves, how am I going to get there? You know, what does it take both psychologically, I guess, and external jobs, whatever, what does it take to get there? And, and uh, that really, I felt was a great way to understand what internal qualities she had and also external in terms of people who were championing her because they knew she was an exceptional, exceptional, you know, uh, litigator and a judge. And ultimately they discovered, of course, as a justice of the Supreme Court, she had all those qualities that we admire mm -hmm. uh, and uh, really doing what I call pathfinding work. So I love that quote actually as a way to sort of ask the audience that question. Right. Um, Kathleen, you were obviously a personal friend of Justice Ginsburg and, and knew her the best, of, obviously, of, uh, of any one of, any one of us. And you said, I believe in the film, that um, her vision of social justice was instructive to everyone. Did you see a, a, a drastic turn in um, interest or litigation regarding gender discrimination only after Ruth Bader Ginsburg began that litigation did the ACLU and other uh, similarly situated law practices concentrate on issues that were not focused on gender discrimination? Uh, Ruth's uh, advocacy, especially at the ACLU, uh, accelerated a movement that was already going on. She herself, uh, and I believe in some of the clips in, in Frida's beautiful movie, she talks about how this movement was going on. Uh, and she never said she did it alone and she didn't do it alone. There was feminism going on on the streets. There was feminism going on in the courts. Uh, there was a rising, uh, rising tide of women's voices and Ruth was part of that zeitgeist. She, it, without her advocacy in the 70s, I don't think we would have gotten as far uh, and as fast. Uh, she didn't do it alone, but she was supremely important. Did you find that there was um, any work, continued work left to do after she left the ACLU, after she got to the, to the bench? Did a lot of the advocacy then still focus on work that maybe she left undone? Um, and, and was there a, a, a more of an exuberance or excitement in the fact that she was on the court and that there would be someone, at least one person on the court who truly understood the work that was being done to bring about um, equality? Uh, there were a lot of things that were left undone when her advocacy at the ACLU ended and she went on the bench. I think that probably the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, the equality of women and girls in public education. Uh, there was a case called Vorchheimer when she was at the ACLU, which we ended up not winning. Uh, a, a bad decision was affirmed by an equally divided court. Once she was on the Supreme Court, the same issue was presented in a case involving the Virgilla, uh, Virginia Military uh, uh, Institute. And after a favorable decision in that case, Ruth said to me, she said to a lot of people, it took me 20 years to win the Vorchheimer case. So that was, uh, that was a, a bit of undone business that she got done. But I would also point out that 
we were uh, we were somewhat narrowly focused during those years at the ACLU. It was absolutely crucial to move things forward, but we didn't have much of a poverty analysis. We didn't have much of a race analysis. We didn't have much of an LGBT analysis. All of that work lay ahead. Uh, Ruth's work was the beginning, but as we all know, here it is 2021. There's lots of work left to be done. Can I ask yeah. Kathleen a question regarding what you just said? Um, had, was there even a consideration at ACLU in the 70s to create a LGBT you know, project the way you, they created in terms of women's, uh, the women's project? There actually was an LGBT project and there was a race discrimination project, but we, they weren't very well integrated. We were quite siloed. We, we had not yet absorbed uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's um, uh, teaching about intersectionality. Uh, and that was learning and um, uh, an understanding that lay in the future. We didn't get it all fixed in the 70s. Interesting. <clears throat> Lily, if I can turn to you, a, a twofold question. One, what does it feel like having such a historic piece of legislation named after you? And equally, what did it feel like walking down the hall with President Obama at the press conference when he signed into uh, law the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act? That's two wonderful questions because I'm delighted to share with you, the audience too, um, to have this bill signed and become in the history books. I mean, it's just an awesome feeling, but walking down that hall on that red carpet that day beside the newly first African-American president, mm -hmm. it was just awesome. And the response I had gotten at the White House that morning when we walked up in the front and waited at the gate to enter was just unreal. My grandchildren looked at me and they thought, I didn't know my grandma was a hero or a um, rock star because people was hooting and hollering and clapping and yelling my name. It was so exciting. But again, um, I didn't get the Ledbetter bill passed all by myself. And I just was just thinking when I was listening to the other ladies speak, how awesome it is what Justice Ginsburg did for the women of this world, all around the world, when she read that dissent in the Ledbetter v. Goodyear case, because she started this Congress working on changing the law because she said, this is not right, it can't stand. And in my case, you can't file a charge in 180 days if you do not know you're being discriminated against. And I work for a corporation that mandated us talking about our pay or sharing with coworkers. So it was really a hard situation. But Justice Ginsburg, I give her credit for changing so much. Uh, she has meant so much to me. I did get to meet her in 2010, and um, we shared so much. Our husbands, we had both lost them, and that was we had that in common. And she shared with me about the big copy of the bill signed by the presidents, framed in a beautiful frame with a pen, and he had brought it and hung it in her office for her. She was so proud of that because she knew she told me that day, the first three jobs that she was fortunate enough to get after she got out of law school, the employer told her up front, we will not pay you what we pay our male employees. Wow. That's and awesome. she wanted that changed. And she and then the Letbetter case, it the really the bill opened the courtroom doors back up for people like myself who had worked for a corporation that kept it a secret and hidden to find out what you were making for 19 years. And um, there's not a reason to wait. Like some people said, oh, people of women don't just wait for big payoff, but the law is still, you can only go back two years. Yeah. That's something, it can ask this question too, and I'm hoping it doesn't uh, uh, reach anything that happened with your, your litigation. But at any time in all the years you spent litigating this case in the trial courts and then the intermediate appellate court level and finally to the Supreme Court, 
was there ever anybody in the higher ranks at Goodyear who um, apologized, who thought this was unfortunate, or was it more so a continued effort to justify the discrepancy in pay? No, uh, in fact, a lot of people would say to me that was higher up in management, not any that could make a decision, something about, well, look what you did. You, you, Cause it took me nine years from the time I started the first filing until the final judgment. Look what you did and you didn't get a dime. I said, no, but I sure got a lot of satisfaction and did get into history books and made a lot of change for a lot of other people because, uh, and you would think, in fact, someone just said to me this past week in an interview, you would think a major corporation like Goodyear Tired Rubber Company that buys all this advertisement and advertises their products that they would want to quieten me down, that they would offer me a decent settlement. The most I ever got offered that I know about was $10,000. And that's a joke compared to what I had lost because in my case working, I worked seven hours, you, uh, seven days, a lot of times, 12 hour shifts, and that's a lot of overtime. So that cost me that pay, plus my pay was already too low. And that also affected my retirement, contributory retirement, 401k and social security. This is why I fight so hard today and travel every opportunity I get to speak because so many women and men too, do not realize that when they begin work, that's when their retirements usually start. You need to work on your retirement from day one and make sure it's right because you'll live on it then for the rest of your life. But you would think a major corporation would have offered a decent settlement, but they didn't. Wow. And a final question, just at least on this topic, did you ever find out who it was that slipped you that anonymous note with the pay discrepancy? No, uh, in fact, it would be uh, very, very few people that I really respected will call me or talk to me because they, if they have retired in management from Goodyear, they're still apprehensive about having Goodyear come after them because that's what major corporations do. When a person stands up, they'll spend you out, they'll wait you out, and they'll wear you out trying to beat you down where you'll give up and go away. And I was determined when I started, I would not quit. I was going to see it all the way through because that's just who I am. And it should be. And the stories I've heard, especially across the United States, it just breaks my heart to know that women have suffered like they have no reason. They've worked, they've earned the money and they should have been paid. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you for that. Frida, if I can jump back to you. So you're known as a theatrical documentary film um, director and writer, et cetera. What's the differences? Are there nuances in theatrical doc documentaries? That's a great question. It's nuances, but actually, um, factually, it simply means that the, the first point of exhibition for many of us is in motion picture theaters, which of course are closed pretty much now, but that's the idea. Historically, uh, instead of making this piece, uh, this film, this story for television, and there was until streaming, uh, primarily people had the choice of either making a film, uh, making a, doing a story for theaters, motion picture theaters, or for television, and then cable came along. So these are all you might say are distribution channels. But for us who love stories that play on a big screen, and that's the idea, there is a style in which one does a film for the big screen, as opposed to necessarily for the smaller screen. But eventually, if you're lucky, all your work, you know, uh, shows in all, diff all of these uh, platforms, we call them, because you're happy if, you know, your work reaches a global audience. And today the global audience is primarily accessed through the streaming service. And that's sort of the, the recent, well, 10 years, at least the recent five years, if not the last year and a half, that's become so dynamic. Yes. And so in that respect, all, all of us making 
stories in media are open to all, all of the platforms. And you, 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 in fact, Ruth um, did open in motion picture theaters in February, but they were all on virtual, like we are now, a virtual cinema theaters that people actually just logged on mm -hmm. the way they have don't logged on for today's uh, uh, screening and event. I don't I hope that's clear, but yeah, yeah, before, when, yeah motion pictures were, sh were not shuttered. That's where we kind of, um, liked our the first the first uh, premiere and usually there's a difference to getting uh, motion picture reviews that seems to drive all the um, possibility all the other um, possibilities for uh, exhibition and then that means also revenue and all those and, and awards and all the things that come along with that Yes, so no, that, that is helpful. And I, um, I unfortunately not seen any of your work before this film. Um, I will definitely be getting to seeing the other one soon. Um, and someone asked too, um, are you work, what are you working on currently? But before I maybe answering that question, can I ask what made you decide to do this? This Ruth in her own words, there had been films out about um, Justice Ginsburg, plenty of books out about her. So what was it that, that, that just prompted you to say, I've got to do this? this that, that's a great question because it's I'm always curious, what is the origin story? You know, how did you start this and why? And it turns out um, half the work our company does, and we're lucky that people come to you and say, you know, it's like going to an architect or going to an attorney. Will you do this contract or will you do this house? Would you do this film? So I was lucky in that two wonderful executive producers um, who had the idea and also the funding um, mm -hmm. came to me uh, and asked if I were interested in doing a film on Ruth Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg. And this was in uh, 215. Mm -hmm. um, and I I thought it was a great idea. I didn't know that much about her. And that's what's great about doing documentary films. It's almost like a, a, a seminar, you know, a graduate seminar. You get to, you get to just dive into subject matter. Um, I had, um, so before you, I said, yes, let me just see what's on, what has been done. And I looked, I, you know, went online. There was nothing in 215 on, on Justice Ginsburg. Wow. Except maybe five, you know, short pieces. Mm -hmm. And so I said, that sounds like a great idea. And actually the other film, which came out a year and a half, two years before this one, RBG, a wonderful film, um, that wasn't even, there was no internet comment on that. So I, I wrote um, Justice Ginsburg, whom I actually had a correspondence, a brief one prior to that, because I had done the film on Anita, Day, on Anita Hill called Anita. Oh. And that was in theaters, it was in, the E Street Theater, it was in the Cleveland Film Festival. It, it played in Cleveland's art houses. Um, but a mutual friend had told her about Ruth and uh, Justice Ginsburg said she hadn't seen it and perhaps could I arrange for her to see that. So I, I, I sent her a copy of, of Anita and, um, and a couple of other films, the Maya Lin film and a couple of um, theater film, music film, knowing that she's interested in those, those uh, subjects. Um, and I was really surprised, I just, you know, a little note, that was it. Uh, I was surprised she wrote me back because I figured she's very busy. <laughs> you know, it was really a beautiful a note from her, as you know, Kathy, it was from her heart and her, you know, and her, it was just, you, you just felt it was she who wrote that um, to be framed. And so that, that was that. So I felt I had a little entrance into maybe writing back when these executive producers asked if I would do this film. So I wrote her in late 2015 and she wrote back, you know, we wrote this little correspondence um, that she let, uh, why don't we wait until 216 after the fiction movie written by her nephew uh, was going to be finished in 216. As you may know, it's called um, On the Basis of Sex. And so 216 came around, the election happened, but there was no film on the fiction movie. So after the election, we, I talked to the executive saying, I think it's time to do this film. We need this film now. We need the ideas and the, you know, and the example of, of you know, just, we need a story about uh, Justice Ginsburg. So that's, that's how it started. I, I was asked to do the film. Uh, I was you know, absolutely thrilled looking back. And uh, we started in 2017 after the inauguration. 
Wow. And, um, you know, went through the, and so it had its first screening in, in DC in um, 219 at the end of the term, uh, Supreme Court term and the AFI uh, screened it at its festival. And I know, I know the president, uh, you know, wrote and invited the justice, but she was, I think the last weekend working on, on her uh, opinions for the closing, um, for the last the term. Yeah. And so, and so finally, is it, could you share anything you're working on now? Um, I have some, I, I have another film in Washington, but it's on hiatus because it's too scary for me to go to Washington. It, it, I won't say the subject, but it, it, it means filming it in, in, in on Capitol Hill. So it's, it's on um, the back burner until things settle down. How's that? Yeah. But actually I've been, I've gotten involved because uh, of the, uh, the Asian, uh, the Asian assaults. And after the Atlantic tragedy, I just got a bunch of my colleagues together and I've been involved in doing uh, PSAs and media around the uh, anti-Asian uh, issue and trying to bring understanding, you know, as an Asian American to, to help turn the tide on that. So that's sort of consuming a little bit of my time. I'm happy to do that. It's a, it, it feels like it's an inflection point for people of the Asian American Pacific Islander community. And um, we're just a, a group of actually lawyers, and journalists and educators and um, um, entertainment individual, high-end people who've won Oscars and, and Emmys. And we are having a lot of fun sort of cross-fertilizing with ideas and how we can you know, bring positive stories about Asia and understand. And that, that's a great segue um, back to you, Kathleen. It seems like um, us lawyers today, uh, those of us in the judiciary and, and um, the law film and the law industry and what's going on across the nation with, with racial reckoning, um, there seems to be more discussion and talk about implicit bias or unconscious bias. And it seems like your work with Justice Ginsburg um, was really recognizing that a whole lot earlier on before the, the terms got coined and, and used pretty much um, as a basis for what systems across the country are looking at for, for ways that people have been discriminated against for centuries. I'm so Do you recall I was gonna say talking about I'm so happy you, you, you brought up that issue because in doing the research and having done films of, about major American figures, I was really struck by how Justice Ginsburg is the only national leader I have you know, studied in the recent past who, who would, you, would actually use her platform to talk about unconscious bias. So I was thrilled to have it be in the film and actually connect it to the example of what happened to the Japanese Americans. And she's also the only national leader I found who would actually speak about the Japanese American internment or concentration camps as the Japanese Americans properly describe that experience. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, it was just, and then, so I was thrilled to be able to, through her spirit and her words, you know, shine light on that issue. And she was pre uh, prescient, wasn't she, when she said the last frontier kind of was unconscious bias. That is what we're seeing. We are. Kathleen, do you remember much conversation back when you were working on cases talking well, about unconscious or implicit bias? That phrase, as far as I remember, uh, didn't really exist in the 70s. But the phrase that did exist, and that amounts to very much the same thing, is uh, stereotyping, pigeonholing, uh, assumptions. I think the phrase implicit, bi uh, implicit bias is kind of a natural next step from those phrases. Uh, Ruth understood and tried to patiently explain to a lot of middle-aged and more than middle-aged white male judges what uh, gender stereotyping, what stereotyping meant. Uh, and that was really the basis of, of all of her litigation. And the phrases and the uh, jurisprudence from her gender cases has been used countless times in race cases. So the uh, uh, 
the, the movement that she understood, the, uh, the wrong-headed thinking that she played a big part in straightening out uh, came from gender cases, but it's been applied in hundreds and hundreds of other cases of discrimination. Yes. As um, any of us or all of us who know about Justice Ginsburg's um, ascension, if you will, the Supreme Court, we all know how huge a role her husband, Marty, met. You were part of that 1993 war team to get her nominated, to get her um, to be the voice of knocking on doors to have people pay attention to her. Although it seems with all the litigation she did as a lawyer, arguing those cases before the Supreme Court, that she would have been recognized and, and put as one of the top candidates. But can you just shed some light into that and the work that was done? And I know you, you testified as the film showed, you were there for um, her hearings, confirmation hearings. So one, what a little bit of background of what that was like, and two, how it felt for you when the people testified against her nomination, as we saw in the film also. Uh, the thing that is hard to believe, but it's true, is in 1993, she was not yet the notorious RBG. <laughs> she was just a judge who'd had a very uh, 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 interesting litigation background. She hadn't uh, stirred very many things up when she was on the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, but she had uh, given a lecture uh, in you know, I'm trying to remember the year. It might have been 1990, uh, uh, called the, or earlier, uh, called the Madison Lecture, in which she questioned uh, the strategy of, uh, of activists and of litigators uh, for the abortion cases that were before the Supreme Court. That questioning of the litigation strategy caused a lot of important feminists to be skeptical of her as a justice on the US Supreme Court. Uh, and as was very famously reported at the time, President Clinton said, uh, the women don't like her. So Marty's uh, work was, was laid out for him. We had to, uh, we had to confront that. Uh, there were teams of uh, people that were to go after for support, judges and uh, activists and law professors and business people and legislators. And my team was feminists. You would have thought the feminists would have been like a million percent on board, but they weren't. So it was extremely exciting. It was very fraught. There was a moment when we thought we'd lost because uh, we thought Breyer was going to be chosen. Uh, and then a moment later we had won and the whole thing was just so completely thrilling one of the most exciting uh, professional engagements of my life. Lily, uh, you said <laughs> your husband passed around the same time uh, Marty Ginsburg passed, and that, that created an additional bond for you with Justice Ginsburg, am I correct? It did, it did. When I got to meet her in 2010, um, we started to shake hands. We could still touch each other then. And uh, I, I told her, said to her then how sorry I was about her losing Marty and his pacing. And uh, I said, I, I, I said, you know, I lost my husband just prior to the signing of the Ledbetter bill. And uh, she said, no. And she backed up and tears started running down her cheeks and she grabbed me and hugged me. She said, well, I'm so sorry for your loss. And then she started sharing with me with the stories about her life and her career, how hard it had been back in the early years. She knew when she read that dissent in that Supreme Court that day, that was what the turning point was for so many women and their families around the world because she challenged Congress to change that back. She said, it's up to you, the ball is in your court. And the ACLU and all the women's groups and other groups in Washington, they would fly me to Washington and I would be up there maybe three weeks a month, four days a week, walking the halls of Congress, going from office to office, Republicans, Democrats alike, asking for support and help for the Ledbetter bill and sharing with each person, maybe a five minute testimony 
about why it is so critical. It keeps children from going to bed hungry and it helps children get a good education and it holds a family together and it makes this country stronger and more successful. And when we did that, um, she was always in the back of my mind because she read that dissent and it meant so much to me. If I ever get tired today, I read her dissent because it means so much. It was so well worded and hit right on the, so, so to speak, hit the nail on the head. And uh, I was so grateful to her and uh, Frito talking about her correspondence. Often I would get a booklet with her, her and my picture on the front of it, or I might get a, a newspaper article or an article out of a law magazine. She would send me with a note thinking that I might like to have that. She also sent me a copy of her, Marty's cookbook. She wrote me a nice note and sent it to me. I mean, she was so thoughtful and she and I corresponded right up pretty close to the end of her time. And the Japanese had come over to America and done a huge, I don't know, about a four page spread on uh, my case and the president and, and Justice Ginsburg. And all I knew, I can't, I don't read Japanese. so. There was a photo of the president, Justice Ginsburg and myself, but it was a huge article and she didn't know about that. And I shared that with her. She was a wonderful, caring person. In fact, my attorney that won my case, he said, don't worry about what she sent. Just hold on to those envelopes that I never knew anyone to get correspondence from a Supreme Court justice. And she was just a very wonderful, caring person. And it showed in her rulings and her her judgment. And every time I could get an article or I get a book, I read everything still today about her and her life because there was so much. She was such an in-depth person, caring, but yet she had fun. She yeah. took trips and uh, she went to operas and, and uh, it, she was just an awesome person. You know, and when I was introducing you in your bio, uh, one of the things I noted uh, was the fact that when you went to work at Goodyear, your husband um, was was opposed to it. Was it opposed to you working out of the house since you had two small children or trying to get a management position? And then what were his- Well, all those he, 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 he just basically did not, he, he would like to have me at home, you know, baking cakes and pies and keeping the house spotless clean and uh, making sure the grass was cut and all those good things. But uh, my children was all for it because they knew what that job would mean to me in their lives. Because uh, coming from a real poor background, people have to start and it takes a long time to achieve, you know, where you need to be. And especially with the wages and they don't go up. They certainly didn't go up back then in those early years. But uh, I knew I was good and I had had management jobs at H&R uh, Block. I had managed 16 locations for them. And I had had um, assistant to the financial aid director at Jacksonville State University. So I knew I had had jobs with responsibility, but I needed more income. And uh, I had been one of those people that had worked six years, two full-time jobs working seven days a week. So going to Goodyear for me was not any different, except it was a little dirtier. Some of the sections I worked in was a little hotter, uh, wasn't air conditioned like some of them, but I worked on the floor in production, making sure that whatever section I had, my employees were there and we put out a product, a good one, no scrap and stayed safe and housekeeping first class. Were, were the um, years of litigation hard on your family? Uh, it was hard on my husband, uh, but he, he backed me all the way. In fact, when I told him that when I started, I said, I'll warn you, it'll take at least eight years. And it took nine. But uh, he supported me and I offered at one point when things got kind of nerve wracking to deed my half of the house to him because that's really all I had in case I lost it. And he said, uh, no, he said, we started with nothing. If we have to start again, we'll, we'll start together. And so he supported me and that was real important. 
for a person to go, and this is really, these kind of cases, um, and I know Kathleen knows this, working with people, it's really hard, and, and you too, Judge, because it's, it's uh, so hard on people because you never know how you'll come out. You can't just finish it. You can't get it closed, and you've got to make sure that every step you take is the right step. And I had the, one of the best lawyers. He taught my case on a contingent basis, which meant he would have gotten 50% of what I got. Of course, I got nothing, absolutely not one penny. So he never got paid. And that firm has a half a million dollars in my case, but they stayed with me. And the people around the country, law firms and law groups supported me to go back and forth to Washington to get that support for the bill. And my husband was dealing with cancer all during that time. That was another problem, but he and uh, my family supported and we all pitched in and, and we made it. But uh, you do find out you lose a few friends along the way when you stand up for something like this. But I don't think they were friends to start with. That, that might've been the case. That might've been the That's case. That's right. Uh, Frida, I love the use of um, your mixed, uh, uh, I guess, presentations in the movie, the use of animation, is that standard mm -hmm. the way you do that? And the, and the sepia colors, uh, particularly the, the jury scene that may, might have been the, the Duran case, um, your depiction of the actual people who we knew, Justice Ginsburg, of course, and the lawyers who argued some of the cases, but I guess for like the jury scene or, or scenes where you had animation of just kind of general people, I noticed that they seem to be kind of nondescript. I was trying to determine whether it was your, your goal to have um, um, kind of mixed culture, mixed background, not to have too defined. I couldn't tell that there was an all white male jury in your jury scene, but I love that mix. Can you talk a little bit about that? Thank you. I love that you singled that particular quality because the, the real challenge was, uh, I said, how can you, I explain these important six constitutional cases? These were critical to understanding the core of the legal work that she had, um, cre you know, she had done. And also it was, you know, key to her being considered for the U.S. Supreme Court. In fact, it was at the turning point. Would you say, Kathleen, that 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 when President Clinton understood what she had done in the '70s, I think there was no question because all things being equal, Kathleen and any of these brilliant attorneys could be Supreme Court justices. But what makes these brilliant attorneys? I consider Kathleen brilliant. You know, different from all of the hundreds, you know, including you. Justice Stewart. I mean, so that, and she wasn't on the short list as you probably read um, initially. And so, um, though, so if, as a storyteller, I felt this was important. But then, how do you explain it to you know teenagers and 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 to cath, you know attorneys without diminishing you know the, the story? So animation became uh, the sort, the way to engage. It's it's cool and people respond to comic books, right? And, and somehow, but we cast, I found a, a, a wonderful animator. He's actually an artist at heart. He graduated with a master's from CalArts and he had done beautiful work on an earlier uh, uh, film on Malala, which uh, on, on the um, young um, woman who, the youngest woman who received a Nobel prize for peace, the one who was uh, shot in the head by the Taliban. And anyway, it was uh, a beautiful film and. A third of it was animation. So, so that was a decision. And then the coloring and being, and it does make a, a difference as you've heard, you know, who is a storyteller? If you cast people of color other than white males, then I think somehow the lens of the storytelling may, it, it is affected. Not to say that um, the subjects can't be, anyway, I, I believe, anyway, so I come to, with, that uh, very conscious of the multicultural aspect of our country. And so in <clears throat> designing, I'm glad that you could see it was, it could be any, it was, it was every man in terms of the, the impact and the color. We, you all can identify, I think, to being one of those jury members maybe. Yeah. So those are conscious decisions in terms of color and um, 
yeah. And, and I thought so. I mean, it had such a, an impact for me, and I noted it, and it made you feel that way as part of it. And even, you know, again, the sepia colors, it was kind of like this was somewhat of a sorrowful time in our, you know, career. It wasn't, you know, bright colors and, you know, it, without it being too somber, overly somber. And and even loved the, the capturing of um, when you were speaking, I think Kathleen was speaking of the role that Marty Ginsburg played in her and getting her nominated. And there was a picture of capture of him sitting in the stands in the, in the hearing room. And he was smiling as if he knew he was we're talking about him at this particular time. Yeah, well, those are every actually, as a filmmaker, actually every frame is vetted. I mean, it's not, it's very intentional. Mm -hmm. And at least for me and for my colleagues, you know, it's, that's purposeful. In the same way, I feel that uh, Justice Ginsburg wrote her brief, wrote her opinions, with a, very clear, very precise, but very also understanding the, the her audience yes. and the impact. And when she did the bench, I, I learned the phrase, a bench opinion, she knew what was going on. Kathleen, could you elaborate better than I on terms of- She made her dissent sing, right, Kathleen? Well, she was a beautiful writer and she was uh, uh, very, uh, it was very important to her to write a, a narrative that would draw people in. Uh, she was more influenced by novelists than she was by judges in her writing. Uh, and I tell a little bit of that in the story that I wrote not too long ago. She was also meticulous. Uh, I had an experience with her number of several years ago, we were together doing something and she brought me a reprint of a law review article that she had written 10 years before. And she had just made <laughs> corrections on it. I said, Ruth, why are you, why are you making corrections on it now and giving it to me now? This was 10 years ago. She just couldn't not do it. But she, it, it bugged her that there was a, a little imperfection and some punctuation, but that's how she was meticulous, but also very engaged with the story. You know, it's interesting, we had earlier conversations, <clears throat> we talked about my affinity, I was fortunate enough to meet her in 2019, and how one of the greatest affinities I think I have with her is, is not getting much sleep and working in the wee hours of the morning. And you said something about, you know, a lot of people would want to have on, on their headstones, you know, I wouldn't want to have, I wish I worked more but she would have the opposite, correct? Yeah, the, the aphorism is nobody says on their deathbed, I should have spent more time in the office. <laughs> I think, but I think Ruth would definitely have been okay with that on her headstone. I think so too. Um, Justice Stewart, yeah. may I add one comment about what Kathleen was saying about her being so picky too. She was to write the foreword for my book when it came out. And uh, when the, publisher sent her a copy and she read it she refused because we had stated in the book and now mind you we had already had legal lawyers read it and try to critique it but when she read it we had said that the law firm took my case on a pro bono case and that was not right and then when we got to the courtroom at the supreme court we stated that my attorney had 10 minutes to wrap up in the closing argument part. That was incorrect too. And she got us straight. She said, but your attorney had three minutes and we justices had seven. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we couldn't get it changed in the print. So she wouldn't, she would not do the forward nor would she write anything at the end or which would not endorse it simply because of that technicality. My lawyer was very embarrassed about it. He didn't catch it. He read it and he didn't catch it. Wow. We're, we're wrapping that's, up. How, that's how that's correct how she was. was. She had yeah. to be exact. Right, we're, we're getting here in our time. So I'd like to end by maybe having all three of you um, say just briefly um, one question <clears throat> that's come from the uh, audience. Uh, one of the questions to you, Lily, is uh, did either your children go into law after all this? I, I think if uh, they had not been so far ahead in their careers at the time, I, my son wanted to. He was in commercial real estate, 
and owned a lot of different companies and he had two degrees and he wanted to be a lawyer, but he just, um, we just never did get the money or funds that we could help him do that. Looking back, we could have, um, but, and my daughter, she was in management and she just retired this year with 39 years with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama. And she retired as a senior vice president, one of two women in the top six slots. So I'm very proud of her. I'm very proud of both of them. And uh, um, it would have been good to have a lawyer in the family. Well, they sound like they're great careers. Anyway, Frida, <clears throat> uh, uh, just briefly, uh, uh, doing this film on the Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg, another notch in your belt, change your perspective on anything with regard to law, the law? I'm, I'm, in, I'm inspired really by her <laughs> life and actually her rigor work. And uh, um, I'm, I, I find for, with this film, I really, it's a vehicle to um, encourage all of us to be good citizens and to be active citizens because it makes a difference in who we vote for and who gets on the Supreme Court. And the idea is that the Supreme Court is a place that really impacts our personal lives in very profound ways by their decisions. Absolutely. And uh, so this film was a chance to sort of open that idea. So. Thank you for that. And the final word from you, Kathleen, if you, if you don't mind maybe putting in uh, in the information on Justice Ginsburg's collars. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm getting one as I, as I had mentioned to you, but I'd also like to, I'd like to point out, I mean, it's my belief that if Ruth had only been a fabulous litigator, if she'd only been uh, uh, an important member of the United States Supreme Court, we wouldn't have all these books, we wouldn't have all these movies, we wouldn't have all these collars. Uh, I think what is what what has engendered all of this attention, all of this interest, is the last ten years of her life when she went around the country speaking to audiences of thousands of Which women and girls and men, and she made she she carried the message to the people. Uh, it, she didn't just sit in her ivory tower, and she became the notorious RBG. She became a meme. She became. An, an, an important character who was known on the world stage, one of the most famous people in the world, and brought this message to thousands of people in person and millions of people who saw it. And to me, that, that those last years of her life in which she did that have far more consequence than uh, her years as a litigator and a Supreme Court justice. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Thank, thank you all, and thank you for allowing me the honor of asking you the questions. Emma, I'm going to shoot it back to you. Thank you. It's wonderful to meet you and see everybody. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all so much. What an incredible conversation. Lily, Frida, Kathleen, thank you for your thoughtful answers. And Justice Stewart, your questions were beyond insightful. Um, I appreciate so very much that all four of you took the time today to be here with us over Zoom and to let us all listen into such a fascinating discussion about the late Justice Ginsburg and the documentary film, Ruth, Justice Ginsburg in her own words. And to those of you who tuned in through Zoom today from home, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the thought provoking questions that so many of you sent in for our speakers today. If we did not have a chance to get to your question, I am so sorry about that. We just had too many good ones to choose from. If you enjoyed today's program, you can join us again this summer for the very final program supporting our RBG exhibition, for Virtual Gallery Talk, the Women's Rights Project with the ACLU of Ohio's Sabrina Harris, which will be at noon on Wednesday, October 25th. You can keep an eye out on our website, www maltzmuseum.org for more information on this program and on other upcoming programs and exhibitions. Thank you again, everybody, and have a wonderful night. Take care. <laughs>